Um, Justine, what do you think the Atmos is going to be like at Tory conference this year? Because, I mean, it's the year hmm. before an election. You'd think it would be quite like gung-ho, yay, let's go for it. I think it's going to be quite tough. And the issue of High Speed 2 is clearly going to dominate it as well. Interestingly, I remember going up to the Conservative Party conference last year thinking Liz Truss should have resolved the 45 pence tax cut question. Like The worst thing to do is leave it in the air. Mm. Because actually you knew she was going to have to back off it. I was pretty sure the rest of it would have to go as well. So I think for this year, um, what Sunak needs to do, of course, is unite the party. He needs to actually bring the internal workings of the Conservative Party together. He's launched policies on net zero that have caused a row in the party. He's maybe going down a route on high speed too that's caused a row in the party. Parties that launch policies and look divided don't win elections. So the most important thing he has to do is bring the party together. The way he can do that is by showing what his actual vision is for Britain. And that hopefully doesn't just bring the party together, it's how he can start to communicate to a wider country about where he wants to take this country and, and why he wants to take it in the direction he's looking at. The problem at the moment is piecemeal policy announcements that even the party itself can't agree on. Mm. One of the traditions pre-conference is that the PM does all these interviews with um, regional TV and local radio, as Liz Truss famously did. Highest rating episode of Newscast ever is our supercut compilation of Liz's interviews. Um, so let's listen to Rishi Sunak chatting to Annabelle Tiffin from North West tonight about HS2. Is HS2 value for money? Well, the HS2 business case is public and everyone can see do it. Do you the, think it's value for money? Well, I mean, you can see it, and it when it's public. It's Prime obviously, Minister, do you think it's value for money? I mean, I mean, you you were a Chancellor. It, I, I was. I, well, it, the, actually, the last update was done before I was Chancellor. But do you but think it's value the, for money? The reality of HS2 is the costs have doubled since it was originally uh, budgeted for in 2012. That's just the reality so of that's the situation. No. Well, there's lots of different reasons for that. But fundamentally, again, there's this fixation on one thing across the North, People use buses every day. People use their cars every day. It's important that we invest in all those forms of transportation too because those are incredibly good value for money and that's why we're doing that too. Rishi Sunak sounding quite hoarse already, which if memory serves is not a great thing before a conference speech. But let's, let's see. Um, Justine, what should he be doing about HS2? And of course, you were a transport secretary who gave a green light to HS2. Yeah, he should confirm it's going ahead. It's in a... full from Euston to Manchester. Yes. Yes, I... I personally think it was a mistake to cut the Yorkshire leg. The whole point of the strategy was to connect up this broader country to high-speed rail. You know, it'd be the equivalent of saying, right, we'll just do the motorway system to Birmingham, and that's a good idea. So I think there is a... it costs so much more now than when you were sat behind the desk. And there's a Treasury spreadsheet always there that says, no, this is all too much. But what that misses is the opportunity cost of not doing it, is the potential, the economic growth that's unlocked by getting on with this. You could, if you'd taken this attitude in Victorian times, we wouldn't have the rail network today. People have said, oh, that's quite expensive. Why do we need that? But actually, we get the value of that literally 140, 150 years later. These are long-term projects. It is hard to value that long-term value, but it's undoubtedly there. And I think there's a, another piece of this, which is investment and confidence in investing. We saw car manufacturers raise real concerns around this change to net zero. And I think for people in the rail industry and more broadly, if you can't rely on those big ticket projects going ahead, then it's going to be very hard to get private sector investment coming into the country. Asha, I wonder how you read this, both politically and then also the machinations of how it's played out, because we've mm. kind of had a look into the kind of workings of government with the bonnet up, haven't we, courtesy of this photo that was taken by Steve Back, a sort of legendary Westminster political photographer, snapping that half an A4 page with some of the numbers around HS2 and the meeting that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor had which led them to be asked questions about whether or not they could commit to the whole thing and not be able to answer them. And now they find themselves in this bind where they're not answering them. The questions keep coming. They're clearly trying to work out what they want to say, but they haven't got the benefit of time because the, the kind of hair is already running. And then that bigger question that Justine speaks to about how in government you square a massive long-term project that may or may not bring great benefits but comes with a colossal and spiralling price tag. Well, we've seen that 
when the Prime Minister comes off the fence, he can definitely do so with a bang on things like net zero. Um, he clearly is itching to come off the fence on HS2. Um, the tre his treasury mind will be telling him that you know the costs are through the roof, something must be done. At the same time, the statesman in him wants to have sort of legacy projects. He's seen how predecessors, you know, like Cameron and Osborne and uh, all, all, all the others, like Boris Johnson in particular, they, they push this through, they champion this project um, as key for the national interest. And so he doesn't want to be seen to you know, be trashing the, the country's future in that way. And so this is the bind he finds himself in. It's why we know that he clearly was trying to sit down with the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt and make decisions and, on this. And he seems to, I think, have been almost overwhelmed by the strength of backlash in response to it. You, you have to ask whether he's starting to sort of dither on this, which would be ironic given that he's now trying to pride himself as someone who can take difficult decisions for the long-term interest. But this is the challenge, isn't it? Because... The city of Manchester, the people of Manchester are about to host the Conservative Party. How can you turn up there when you're not willing to answer probably the most strategic question the city asks, which is, is this key rail line coming to us or not? And we are in a position where he is being asked the question and he needs to provide an answer. Now, if there's an alternative investment package, Say what that is. Say but why is, you think it's better. But is but that doable do in the time available? Because like, the, com the conference starts on, on Sunday. And as we know, these decisions and these spreadsheets and the meetings take a long, long time. Mm. What, well, what's doable in the time available to I'm, shut this down? I'm afraid in politics, you've got to succeed in the real world, not the one that you'd like. We'd all like more time to take our decisions as secretaries of state. But actually, this is a strategic question. It, it's it's more than just HMT spreadsheets. And there's a political issue of how it's been handled now that is actually really important for people across the north about whether they can trust promises made on investments but, on but levelling up. does that mean he basically has to write a blank cheque for HS2? Because you're saying just come out no, and say means, you're committed to it, whatever the cost. Basically. It means there needs to be proper cost control, as we see with High Speed 2 uh, project rail projects in other countries. Are we really saying that other countries can do this, but we can't, we can't control the cost, so therefore we don't get to do it? Is that really what we're saying? I think the answer to that has to be no. We have to have a, a professionally managed project. The reality is the costs have gone up, partly because the routes have been changed, because there have been prevarication over key sections of the line, and that is what's driven up the costs as much as anything else. Another sort of strategic question for you, for you both, really, a, a political strategic question. How does so the Conservative Party, one of the reasons, I guess, for the Conservative Party's great success going back over a century or so is that ability to sort of mould to the moment, to, mm. to regenerate. But after a long old stint in government and with multiple prime ministers, what are we on to... Prime Minister number five, from Rishi Sunak's perspective, but potentially the capacity to sort of refresh an office, I guess diminishing returns might start kicking in and the opinion polls would certainly suggest that. So I wonder what each of you would say to the sort of question, if you had Rishi Sunak on the other side of this table, what should he do in Manchester? What does he need to do? Not just on a question like HS2, but the big vision thing after a year of trying to stabilise the, the, the ship of government to give himself and give the party the best chance of being as competitive as they can be in the next year. He's got to deliver on a promise of equality of opportunity and have some real ambition. This country has ingrained inequality of opportunity. That is not just going to change. You are going to have to take strategic decisions to make things different. High Speed 2 is one of those, but by no means the only one. He should be going to conference with a bold package to give people a sense of genuine change. At the moment, he's got a conundrum. He says it's about change, but the net zero uh, case was actually, let's do change a bit slower. He says it's about change. But the high speed two decision is, well, actually, let's not change this bit of the country. They don't need a high speed railway line. So he's got to be bold, but it's about having the right vision that I think will really deliver on a promise that won the Conservative Party a landslide, which was levelling up. Do you think he has it in him? Well, time will tell. But I don't think... That sounds like a no. I've not seen a sufficiently ambitious plan to tackle the level of challenge that Britain has and we have to see the levelling up uh, promise delivered on. And it's an economic question as much as anything else. It's going to be talent and human capital that wins the economic races of the 21st century. And therefore, 
the Conservative Party really needs a comprehensive plan as to how it's going to deliver on that vision. It strikes me that Rishi Sunak is gearing up to run on effectively a money-saving expert manifesto. Because when you see how he justified the change on net zero, he kept saying, you know, I'm going to take the tough decisions. I'm not going to have you paying, you know, thousands of pounds more in order to hit net zero. And he wants to do it in a way that's affordable for families. Thus, he opens the dividing line with Labour of, well, they would make you pay through the nose for net zero and their environmental greeny plans. I'm sensible. In the same breath, you can imagine HS2, whatever way he lands on this clearly he's gonna have to pose as the champion of you know the public purse and so i think that's gonna be the theme that runs through so much of this he's gonna say that effectively he's on the side of people hard-working people and their pay packets you're gonna have lots of refrains about the pound in your pocket you know this is the kind of you know martin lewis pm effectively and i suppose you've kind of got to do that because there's not money around for the traditional pre-election tax cuts so Mm. the only way you can help people financially is by stopping imposing costs i suppose technocrats don't win elections, people take it as given that you're going to run the country effectively. You don't get any brownie prizes for being competent. Mm, they uh, don't want you managing to climb. Decent, you know, Gordon Brown, trees made decent people. That's not enough. What people want to see is where you are taking the country. The reality is on, on issues like social mobility, there's a huge part of the solution that comes from mm. outside of government. It's about businesses changing as well. It's not all about spending more money through a failing system. It is about changing the system. And that is a fundamentally different objective than just saving a few taxpayer pounds. Well, you've taken us to the end of this episode of Newscast. Quickly, which Star Wars character would you be? Oh, Han Solo, of course. Modest, Justine. Oh, I've got to be Princess Lena, haven't I? I mean, Aim well, high. Well, equally, <laughs> more, everyone's gone for the A-list, right? Um, and you've been an A-list bunch of guests. So thank you very much to everyone who's joined us in this episode of Newscast. You can listen to our daily podcast episodes on BBC Sounds. Bye. Bye-bye.